have another little uh, blast of Alistair Alpen McGregor because uh, he wrote another thing uh, about the Mull of Kintar. I mentioned when we were at the lighthouse that um, he he always said it was dark when he went round the Mull of Kintar and it was this terrifying in myth and legend as going around the Horn and uh, the Cape and all that kind of thing. Well, I looked up his book on St Kilda and discovered that uh, he, or was reminded of the fact that he made, he, he wrote a little bit about doing exactly that. I thought it would be amusing just to read this bit. So here we are in what I don't think is going to sunshine, I don't think it's going to last, but I will just, um, I'll just treat you to this little snippet from Ur Alistair on his way to St Kilda to witness the evacuation in 1931. And it's from his book, um, uh, A Last Voyage to St Kilda, published in, uh, it doesn't, it's published in 1931, and it's subtitled it's subtitled being the observations and adventures of an egotistic private secretary who was alleged to have been warned off that island by Admiralty officials when attempting to emulate Robinson Crusoe at the time of its evacuation. So, by Alistair Alpin McGregor, author of, it says, Summer Days Among the Western Isles, Over the Sea to Sky, etc., etc., with 52 illustrations, and it's dedicated in remembrance of Torquil the Timid, who passed from me in the beauty of his youth, whose muteness at his passing was more eloquent than all the words men have uttered down the centuries. And we have a picture of Torquil the, Torquil the Timid at the, at the, in the frontispiece. He's a really lovely looking shaggy collie. The, the narrative is accompanied by a map and shows his route from Greenock, round Kintar, up to Collinsey, then to Oban, Tobamori, Tyree, uh, Elgol, Carbost, Uig, um, Tarbaton, Harris, Loch Maddy, Loch Boysdale, Eriske, Castle Bay, back to Loch Maddy, and then out to St Kilda. Quite a route. And this is what happens as he is rounding the Mull, because we are on the Mull here. By the way, the wind is getting up again. In my sleep in his cabin on the uh, <clears throat> on the Hebrides, that's the name of the, the boat they're on, in my sleep I could hear and feel the seas thumping on our starboard as we rounded the Mull of Kintyre in the small hours. As a, a man who thinks a little bit about sailing, it, it does strike me as slightly odd that the seas were thumping in the starboard rather than the port side, because the starboard would be in the side close to the land. But anyway, there we are. Many a tale of the mull has my ancient father told me, for he travelled countless times in this ert between Lewis and Glasgow in his college days, when steam navigation was far from its present state of efficiency and the picturesque windjammers still held their own. I share with a young and intelligent Glasgow fellow name, named Ian Anderson a large cabin containing the only bath aboard the Hebrides. We have been accommodated here on the understanding that we, should, that we are prepared to turn out as early as 6am should any passenger insist on having a bath. On turning in for the night, the steward thrusts his head round the corner of the door to inform us that a certain Earl and Countess aboard, and also Sir Tom Noddy, had indicated their intentions independently of having a bath at daybreak. This piece of news we regarded as disconcerting, for it means our rising betimes and packing our belongings in such a way as will avoid their being soaked by the splashing nobility. As it happens, however, their bathing propensities are frustrated by my new friend, Ian Anderson, aforesaid, 
who, when the steward comes to us in the small hours to warn us of approaching bath time, seizes the opportunity of mentioning that during the night the cabin has been the retreat of a number of odd combat voyagers. Rounding the mull has been too much for the majority of those aboard. With that air of self-confidence so characteristic of Glasgow folk in similar circumstances, the said Ian delivers himself to the steward at least thrice of the following in the following rhetorical terms. Quote, Present my compliments to the Earl and Countess, and tell them that at the moment the cabin containing the bath is occupied by a couple of passengers who, during the night, were well nigh unto the point of death. End of quote. So impressed by this piece of spontaneous oratory is James Adam, steward in chief, that forthwith he communicates with the Earl and Countess and Sir Tom Noddy, who in reply present their compliments and send their condolences to our cabin with the threat that they will essay to bath on the following morning. But just fancy, members of the nobility of Scotland coming aboard a ship of this kind without having attended to their personal ablutions. Then our guide philosopher and friend carries on. I come, come on deck as we are cruising between Isle and the Passageway waiting for the Pioneer to clear from the pier at Portaski, etc. I leap ashore with my camera, unshaven and washed, and dash around in the very few moments of my disposal. Before long the Hebrides dropping out anchor in Scalaseg Bay and is approached by the Collinsey ferry boat packed with lobster boxes and a pickle of passengers designed, destined for open our next port of call. The adventure continues. Well, this is an absolutely beautiful place to sit and read, although for choice I'd have it on a slightly less windy day, but it's, we're still getting these northwesterlies that we had the other day, so we're comparatively sheltered here. But you're never totally sheltered from the wind anywhere in the west of Scotland. That is one of the pleasures of the place. It drives all the sunbathers and general lollers and lollers and luxury away. Yeah, I kind of got there next time. I'm sure.